Wafa Labridat. You are listening to the Women Power Podcast, a subsidiary platform to the Women Power Summit, the largest event in MENA, with the aim of empowering women and helping them achieve their absolute highest potential. Each week on the Women Power Podcast, you will hear honest, vulnerable, authentic, real conversations from inspiring women. These women will share their experiences and stories into what it takes to build a successful business and career. The podcast will share insight and inspiration and hopefully inspire action and lead change. Hiba Fisher is a serial entrepreneur and journalist. She's the co-founder and CEO of Kerning Cultures. Kerning Cultures produces immersive podcasts for the curious listener with Arabic and English podcasts that regularly top the charts across the Middle East. Um, so thank you so much for doing this with me. And you are just so wonderfully accessible and available to us emerging podcasters. So I'm just so grateful. Oh, dude, please. I'm honored. Thank you for inviting me to the Women Power podcast. I just wanted to ask you about COVID and how are you using this time? Are you feeling anxious at all? Oh, man. Um, yeah, there's definitely, I think it comes in waves, the the anxiety. Um, I've been practicing breathing. <laughs> and I don't know if that's like a consequence of COVID or that's just a consequence of Ramadan and not sleeping properly, not exercising. I have no idea. But like, I, I find myself really focusing on my breathing a lot more than I ever have in my life. And um, my dad's always taught me that like most people don't breathe from your like you don't when you typically take an inhale in your normal you know subconscious breathing pattern you're you're breathing really only from your shoulders up you're not really breathing all the way down from your diaphragm and filling filling your lungs with air so I've, I really tried to be intentional about that of just taking super deep breaths and and I find that that calms me down a lot and especially before going to sleep um I find that that helps me sleep a lot better uh but uh, but alhamdulillah, I mean, Amatan COVID has been has been fine. We haven't really been affected as a family. Um, some some family members have have gotten sick and have gotten better. Alhamdulillah, so that's been wonderful. Um, my dad's actually here from Jeddah, which uh, that was a, a a real source of concern because he was basically, I mean, he was at home alone uh, and he wasn't able to leave the country for for about five weeks and then when they opened the borders uh dubai was still closed so he came he came to join uh, my husband and i here in seattle um and uh, and so that's been really special especially for for ramadan to to have some time together as family um so yeah things are things are things are okay alhamdulillah and i i, I just uh, i focus on the fact that we're all healthy and and half of us are together uh, and the other half are, are together on the other side of the world and and that's that's the important thing how about you? How are, how are you doing with COVID and a four-month-year-old child? So I have been on bed rest for almost 10 months, like for my entire pregnancy. Um, oh. And so when anyone asks me, I'm just like, this is just an extension of my last 10 months. So right when I had the baby in December... And then, like I'd say, March, I started feeling like myself. And that's when COVID started. Uh, but I'm just so grateful because I get to walk every day. I think when you're, you know, lying flat for 95% of your, of 10 months, you're just so grateful to breathe some fresh air and go for a walk. So as long as I can do that, that really anchors my day and keeps my spirits up. So I think, yeah, we're doing okay. Just about your breathing, are you like meditating? Are you using any apps at all? Um, so we we actually launched a podcast show uh, for for Ramadan. It's not uh, it's not uh, connected to Ramadan. We just launched it in time of Ramadan uh, called Sukun, and it's um, I, I've never been into meditation. I've never been able to do it, uh, but but there's something about this uh, this show. It's a five minute daily uh, guided meditation in Arabic, and it's. Um, it's I, I, I love it. So I, I've been doing that as like to start my day with as often as I can. I, I, I won't pretend like I'm able to do it every single day, but uh, but that that's been really helpful. Um, but otherwise, I, I, I'm, I'm not usually a meditator. No. 
So have you had a really bad day during COVID, like a shitty day and or like a horrible day? And have you managed to turn it around? We're fundraising for Kerning Cultures right now. Um, and uh, and I, this is a process is always really hard. And uh, and I, there was uh, there was a day recently, maybe about two weeks ago, where I, I was just having very uh, discouraging calls with with potential investors. And so I, I took the rest of the day off, actually. And I just I went for a long walk. There's a park about a kilometer and a half from from our house. Uh, and I went and I took a nap under the sun. <laughs> and that really helped. I did some journaling. Uh, and, and when I came back, I felt a lot better. And alhamdulillah, like I've been I've been in good spirits. It's hard sometimes to feel like you don't have control of the situation, but uh, but I, I I'm okay in that uncertainty now. I think before it was it was really tough. When you said that you were on the when you were chatting to some investors and it was discouraging, is it because of COVID or just because investors are not? Like they don't understand the podcast world or the podcast ecosystem. All of the above. I think. I think in general, like fundraising. So, so Kerning Cultures is the first and to this day only venture backed podcast company in the Middle East. Like we're 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 literally creating a category of media, and with that comes all the opportunity, and then also all the uh, lack of understanding and knowledge. Like it's totally new business to back uh, with venture capital, and so so the it's it's always. Um, like I'm, I'm prepared for how difficult fundraising our second round is going to be because it was just as hard the first time around. I think that particular day it was, there were two two calls with with investors back to back who I was actually really excited about, uh, and then in the end they said no. Um, so I think that that's that's what was hard was just that I, I thought that they would be awesome partners. But do you find that part of your job? like the part about educating this part of the world about this industry, is it exhausting for you? Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I'm I'm bored or exhausted by that part. I think that comes with the territory. And and I'm actually really excited when I meet somebody who, who hasn't listened to podcasts before, they haven't before, they haven't heard our podcasts before, and then and then I get to introduce them to it, and then they listen, and they love it. Like, th- that part is, is really exciting. We've been studying the industry for the past five-plus years, so I feel very, very prepared to, you know, paint the picture as vividly, as vividly as possible for you in terms of how podcasting is the future of media, and particularly in the Arab world. So how many podcasts do you listen to? I have a, an, a number on my phone. I bounce around between apps, actually. I think it's like half of me doing research of like what the UX of the different apps looks like over different periods of time. So I listen on Apple Podcasts and uh, and Spotify. Um, sometimes I listen on Acast and sometimes on Radio Public. And uh, the kind of shows that I like, so I, I love I love storytelling. I, that's Those are my favorite. Uh, those are my favorite kind of podcasts, the ones that you get completely lost into these, into these story worlds that the producers are creating for you. I don't always choose shows that are like educational. Uh, sometimes I do if it's industry specific, like if we're talking digital marketing or or something about the podcast industry. Uh, but for the most part, I just enjoy listening to quirky, nerdy, really cool stories where as a byproduct, you learn something, but that wasn't the core focus. It was just a good story. And I, I love the kind of podcast that I, I can turn and have a conversation with my with my friend about. Actually, one of my favorite ways to listen to podcasts is on really long road trips uh, with family or friends, particularly my dad is like my favorite companion for this. And we'll listen to an episode of of Radio Lab, and and then pause and get into a a long philosophical debate about <laughs> about the story, and then resume listening, and then continue. And you know that's that's my favorite way to listen to podcasts. So has your dad and have your parents always supported you? on this journey to creating your own podcast and your own network? My parents are always supportive. They're, they're the kind of parents that tell you you can you can be anything, you can do anything. And we certainly all believe that. And they're, they're very supportive along the way. And yeah, they're wonderful. So tell me, how did you discover podcasting? I, uh, I first learned of the world of podcasting. A friend, uh, my friend Sarah from college, sent me uh, an email with a link to Radiolab, actually. And I, I don't remember what episode it was, but this was back in, in like 2008. And I remember that, that email sat in my inbox unopened for like, I don't know, a month or something. Because when I saw how long the file was in the link that she had sent, I said, this is insane. Like, I don't have an hour to spend listening to something who has an hour to spend listening to a podcast? But uh, but I listened on a long drive. For people who don't know what Kerning Cultures is, 
Can you just explain it to our audience? Yeah, sure. Uh, so so Kerning Cultures is a podcast network. Uh, we started in Dubai, but we now have producers in Beirut, Cairo, Riyadh, Dubai, still uh, the UK and the US. And we produce uh, what we call immersive podcasts for the curious listener. And so we have seven Arabic and English shows underneath the network of Kerning Cultures. Um, very documentary style storytelling, everything uh, about love and relationships. Um, we have a, a show um, featuring exceptional Arabs around the world and their journeys to the top. Uh, so it's it's multi-genre, um, but the, the common thread is it's all excellent storytelling. And, and I think the other beautiful thing about listening to Kerning Culture shows is when you listen to an episode, you'll hear voices from all across the Arab world, which is which is quite awesome. So... Was it always in the plans that you were going to build a network or did it start off as a podcast and then it organically grew into multiple podcasts and then a network? It started as a single, the vision was uh, was much smaller when we first started. It was just a single show, uh, the Kerning Culture show, our flagship show. And then as we got better at storytelling, um, we realized the opportunity of of producing more shows, uh, building out into a network. But I would say that that transition of like actually building a network really happened in the past two years, and and we started we started our first our first show a little over five years ago. I love the story about the name Kerning Cultures and where it came from. Can you share that story with us? So I didn't come up with the name for for Kerning Cultures. It was a a friend uh, who has an advertising agency, so he's very good with with naming things um, and coming up with taglines. And so uh, we were brainstorming a name for this podcast. And at first he suggested the name Delta as, as a show name. And, and then uh, and then we hung up and he called back and he said, you know, actually Kerning, Kerning Cultures is, that sounds like a podcast name. And, uh, and <laughs> I didn't know what Kerning meant. And so I had to Google it. And, uh, and when I learned of the meaning and the metaphor behind the name, uh, I, I thought it was, it was, a, a perfect name. So so kerning is a process in typography. It's the sizing of spaces between letters in a font so you can read a word more clearly and so it's more aesthetically pleasing. And so it's uh, the, the metaphor behind the name is um, the spaces in between cultures through the stories that we tell. And were you on your own when you started out? Did you have a partner? I started KC with like four episodes and uh, or, or the first three episodes, actually, before our first producer joined us, Dana Balut, and then was uh, recruiting more producers. And, and a friend, um, Rizana Zayani, uh, messaged back to she's a fantastic storyteller and she comes from a video uh, background um, and so she she first joined as a producer and we were working on um, on an episode about food security actually and and what it's like growing food in the desert uh, in, in Dubai and um, and I loved the way that she approached the story and I, I just I mean her mind is brilliant and so pretty quickly with uh within her working on on some stuff for Casey I asked her to be my co-founder and so we uh worked on Kerning Cultures together for about 2 years um and then she stepped back and 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 I've been with you know 11 other fantastic humans as our team been been building Casey since why did you invite her to become your co-founder? Did you feel like you needed a co-founder? Yeah, I did. I, I definitely felt like I needed a co-founder. And it's um, nice to speak to somebody about the company. <laughs> I mean, you have you have your team, but uh, but it's it's always nice to have somebody at a strategic level that you can brainstorm ideas with and 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 just talk about the dream with. And then the the other more uh, critical piece I would say is that. Like I didn't have a background in media or journalism coming into KC. Like KC has been my my first real introduction to my first real Kerning Cultures has been my introduction into the media world. And in the very beginning, I I felt like I was missing something because I I had a business background. I knew how to build companies. This was this was my third company uh, that I was building. Uh, but I I didn't know journalism. I didn't study journalism. I never worked in journalism. Uh, whereas Rizan had 10 plus experience uh, as a journalist and a, and a very talented videographer for, you know, hotshot outlets. And so that that complementary skill set uh, was was a, a really powerful dynamic for sure. So was it hard for you guys to kind of go your separate ways? Are you guys still in touch today? Yeah, uh, we're. I mean, I, I love her very much. We're still very good friends. Um, so she stepped back in. Uh, it was just before we joined this media accelerator in San Francisco called Matter, which was in 
February of 2018. So she she stepped back before that. And that was that was really hard, you know, going from a, a partnership to, to running this solo and, and figuring out first trying to figure out how to fill all the gaps that 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 were now there. But then also just like I had mentioned is I think as a solo founder, it, it's, it's quite lonely. And that was I remember making a conscious decision that I, I like having a team was incredibly important uh, because then then we could all be building this together. And so we went from because pr- previously we had producers coming in and out. It was everyone was working on a volunteer or for equity basis. Like it wasn't it wasn't sustained at all. It was very much a, a haphazard operation. And so in 2018, there was, I made this conscious decision that we, we needed to have a more consistent team. And Razan is still an advisor to Kerning Cultures. Um, what did that relationship teach you? With Razan, she taught me storytelling. I can't credit her enough for that. I, I like working together for, for two years. Um, I learned a lot about story structure from the way that she would structure stories. I learned a lot about interviewing. She she taught me she taught me so much of of the skill set that I have for producing good stories and in audio. So how do you choose your hosts for your podcast? So in terms of how we choose uh, hosts, it's it's more based on good producers uh, than it is looking at any kind of a of a personality. I would say, which is which is something that we want to experiment a little bit more with uh, moving forward and. And for that, I mean, you just look for a person who's very charismatic, who's very curious, um, because the, the the medium of podcasting, one of the most beautiful things about this is this is not traditional radio, right? Like this is this is very intimate. This is very casual. This is very informal. Um, and it's like you're listening to friends talking. And so uh, to be able to recreate that, that kind of a vibe uh, when you have a microphone stuck in front of your face. Um, and to be articulate and, you know, all of that, like, I think that takes a certain kind of uh, of a person. When you visit the Kerning Cultures website, I just found it so inviting. And the message of the site was that it was really open for collaboration. You're always looking for new ideas to tell and new stories to tell. So how can someone collaborate with Kerning Cultures today? If somebody wanted to collaborate with Casey, so we're always looking for story pitches across all of our shows. Uh, we're always looking for show ideas. If you ever wanted to pitch a full-blown show from a brand perspective, I mean, we we work with advertisers all the time to, to run ads across our shows uh, to produce uh, what we call branded content or, or white label shows for brands. There's a, a thousand different ways that you can work with us. And we're, we're always open to, to any other ideas that, that people might have. This podcast is brought to you by the Women Power Summit. The Women Power Summit is an annual event that hosts more than 2,000 guests to listen, learn, and network with more than 100 plus speakers and industry leaders. The summit creates space for growth, learning, discussion, and collaboration with the means of creating a space where women can support each other, ask questions, be curious, and be inspired. So just speaking of teams, I think what you have with Dana is really beautiful in terms of like this, like you're super synchronized. You guys just have a lot of chemistry and you can hear it in your voices when you guys co-host an episode or when she interviewed you. How do you build a strong team and, and find people that believe in you, especially as a startup? And how do you get that buy-in from people like Dana? How do we build a strong team? So the first to say we're extremely fortunate that we have such awesome people working on KC and, and building this together. Like, I'm so grateful. I think I think part of it is, is self-selection, to be completely honest. Like, the majority of our producers found us, uh, whether it's from listening to, to our shows or when we were actively hiring. And, uh, and so that helps a lot. And to your point of, like, Going on our website and seeing it is very open and collaborative, which is a which is a very kind compliment. I think the self selection piece is probably fueled by the way that we show up as a company in in the public sphere, and so I, I think I think our culture and our ethos is is quite apparent uh, across all platforms, whether it's the different shows or social media or our website or or in person, and uh, and so I think that attracts a certain kind of profile. I think the the other detail is, I mean, when we when we interview somebody for a position at KC, we're we're looking for 
certain skill sets, yes, but we're also looking for what motivates them. Why do they want to join Kerning Cultures? What do they think about media in the Arab world? You know, do they want to change something about it? Uh, and, and I think those those questions kind of help filter into the, the, the kind of person who is very much aligned and in terms of the mission of, of what we're doing at KC, which is really telling the kinds of stories that we as Arabs can can be proud of and creating media that, that speaks to us, like our, the, the younger generation. And, uh, and in terms of like being able to, to build a team culture where everybody feels really close, I mean, we really do feel like a family. And, and I think what's, what's extraordinary is there's, uh, <laughs> there's a few people on our team to this day I have not met in person. Like we've been working together for, um, for over a year now, and I, I haven't my, our relationship exists over the interwebs, which is insane to think about, but it's just a reality of, of modern society, I think, and it's just going to continue to be the norm. I believe that one way that you nurture those kinds of relationships is we're, is we're really, it's funny. So Mahmoud, my husband, uh, he, <laughs> whenever I do a call with our team members, uh, it, when we first got married and he would see me do calls and he's like, I don't understand. Like you spend 20 minutes just socializing. Like how, if it, that's not efficient. Why are you spending 20 minutes socializing? And then now with COVID, where everybody is is virtual and everybody is remote, and you know, of course, he's he's working from home and not going into the office. He's starting to do that as well, and he's realizing that for his team, like they have to build in social hour, like they do happy hours <laughs> over Zoom, which is ridiculous. So, what do you wish people would know if they would start podcasting? I know that you've been so good to me, and you've mentored me when I first started this podcast. So, what? What would you want people to know before they start their podcast? The first thing is to really study the catalog of shows that exist and make sure that you're you're bringing something to the table. I would say that like entry into podcasting is the barrier to entry is very low. Uh, I consider it the same way as as blogging. You know, it's it's anyone and their mother can start a podcast. You just record on your smartphone and then you put it up on SoundCloud and boom, you have you have a podcast. Um, what that leads to is a lot of noise and a lot of clutter. And I think it's 70% of podcasts never make it past episode five, for example. And and so you start a show and then you realize this is actually not good and then you kill it. And, and then it's just a lot of clutter, uh, to, to put it in a very crass way. As, and certainly for listeners from a discovery perspective, like now they're sifting through literally a million podcasts to find to find the ones that they want to listen to. So if you're going to start a podcast, be intentional about it and, and really, really consider what newness you can bring to the medium and what are you doing differently and what value you have to bring to people and, and really make it worth your listener's time. I, I can't stress that enough. I think valuing your listener's time is really, really important and honing your craft so that you put something out that that is that's worth their time. And then from a practical perspective, if you're starting a show, uh, make sure that you have a, a set number of episodes ready to go before you launch. Uh, I think too often podcasters make this mistake where they'll They'll, they produce their first episode and then they say, okay, I'm ready to go and they launch and then they don't realize actually how long it takes to produce episode two, three, four, and five. And so then there's a gap in, in a release schedule because it now you have to go back to the drawing board and produce all these other episodes and then you can release them. Um, so just go through the, the, the whole process from start to finish of... Uh, of producing an episode uh, a couple of times over so that you you know what your own uh, timeline is for, for how long it takes you to, to get something out. Uh, and then you can manage your release schedule so that you can be consistent because that's the biggest thing is you're, you're building a habit with your listeners, um, whether it's you want them to tune in at the same time every week or as they're, you know, going for a walk in the evening or whatever timing that you're thinking the use case will be for the listener. Um, making sure that you're consistent in your output is, is really important in, in helping to, um, to make it uh, a, a regular experience for the, for the listener, which is ultimately what you want. You don't want somebody to listen and then never come back. So what have you seen successful podcasts do in MENA? I think all of that. So definitely just consistency and output is important. Quality of production is really important. Like I think listeners will forgive you for crappy sound quality uh, so long as the content is really, really good. And then as you get that sorted, like invest in good recording gear. And it doesn't have to be something super expensive. Like as I mentioned, I'm, I'm seated in my bedroom under our duvet that's draped on a coat rack with, you know, my thousand dollar recording kit. It's expensive, but it's not prohibitive 
relatively expensive and you buy it once and it's an asset that you have for the duration of your podcast production. But I'm, I'm not in a fancy recording studio, right? Like it, it doesn't have to be something that you you can do at makeshift. And uh, and so just invest in, in good audio quality because our ears. <laughs> and uh, and the other thing that I see good podcasters or what I think to be good pos- podcasters across the region doing is that they're really engaging their audiences. And so I really believe that media should be a two-way channel of communication and and uh, and it's not just a matter of putting stuff out and and that's it, but but really trying to engage your your audience in in a dialogue. And so whether that's like for Kerning Cultures before COVID, we we would host listening parties in different cities around the world where our producers are and, and gather our community in, in coffee shops and art galleries. And we'd play an episode live and then have a discussion about it afterwards. And those are some of and still are some of my favorite evenings, hands down, and people are crying and you're sitting there for hours. And it's such an incredible way to build a community. The COVID iteration of that is what we're doing Instagram live discussions between producers and guests and answering questions. And, and little things like that, I think, really make a difference. And they also really bind your audience to what you're producing and they feel a part of it. Um, as opposed to just being a, a passive recipient. And are you a big believer that Arabic is the way to go? Would you say that people need to be investing in Arabic shows because there's an opportunity there or does it matter? Yeah, I, I do believe that Arabic is is a huge opportunity for the podcasting scene in, in the Arab world. And obviously that just makes sense. That's our primary language. I do think that there's a space for English shows and I don't discount that. I think that there's um, there's an importance in telling our stories and, and whether it's for Arabs in the region who still prefer to, to speak in English or for diaspora where they don't speak Arabic that well, you know, 80 million diaspora globally. I think there is a huge market and, and a huge need for, for also English content. Um, but uh, but 100% Arabic is, is where the growth opportunity is. And, and that's just statistics. So what have you learned about yourself in the process of setting all of this up? I think actually an investor asked me a really uh, pointed question, which I thought was awesome. And she asked, what do you think your superpower is? And it was the first time that I'd ever really thought about it. And I told her, I think my superpower, uh, which I've discovered through the process of Kerning Cultures, because this is, um, Casey is my third company, but it's the first time that I've been uh, really at the helm. What I've learned that I think my superpower is attracting uh, really incredible and talented people to join our team, to build Kerning Cultures together. We really all love each other very, very much. I'm realizing that that's that's quite unique. And everybody is working so hard at KC and, and they're doing it because they, they believe in this mission. And being able to facilitate that is, uh, is something that I wouldn't have been able, I, I don't think I knew about myself before KC. As a CEO, so you mentioned that you are now really shifting your energy and focus on raising funds. So when you first raised, I don't know if it was your first round for Kerning Cultures, that made headlines. That's how I first heard about Kerning Cultures. It was the first and I think still the only podcast network that has achieved that goal. Can you tell us a bit more about how did you land your investment? So that was our seed round. We raised 471,000 US and it was a, a round led by 500 startups, which is a VC. Um, they, they're in a couple of cities, but mainly Dubai. And uh, and then we also raised from the other institutional investor was a fund called Pod Fund, which is an, an American based VC that invests exclusively in podcast companies. And we were uh, among their first investments, and within their portfolio is Pushkin Industries, which is Malcolm Gladwell's podcast company, which is really awesome. And then we raised from angels in, in the region and then internationally. And the process took eight months, and the only reason that we were able to do it is because I also shifted. Uh, I, I wasn't as involved in production. We had a team that was able to keep literally everything else running. Uh, because fundraising and, and any founder will tell you this fundraising is a, is a full-time job and uh, and it's it's also a volumes game um, and I think that was one of the things that I've uh, come to learn is I've learned that it's uh, <laughs> it's it's very much like finding a husband or a boyfriend <laughs> is, is is what the process is like and in, in my mind where I used to think that like if I go into a pitch meeting having all the facts and all the statistics and I paint this very vivid picture for you of all these trends of where the world is going and how podcasting is taking us there, 
um, that that would be enough to convince to con- to convince you to invest in us. Um, but really, that you need. Uh, but it's a lot more about the chemistry and the compatibility between you and this other person across the room and their team. And when you find a good fit uh, from from a chemistry perspective, from a from a just like I like you as a person, and I and I also believe in the vision that that you see. Uh, that's that's when it clicks. And so that took a while to learn to find that fit is is a volumes game. And so you just I mean, I have a list on a, I have an Excel spreadsheet of, of all the potential investors, uh, whether for, for the seed round, whether they were individuals or they were institutional. Um, and you just you go down the list <laughs> and uh, and I keep track of, of all the conversations and what the last steps were and what needs to happen next. Who was instrumental in bringing in more investors? Does your accelerator support you with that and connect you? Are you pretty much on your own trying to figure things out to do your investors open doors for you? Our investors are instrumental in opening doors for us. They're awesome. Uh, And so the way that it works is we send them what's called a forwardable. So we make it super easy. So I send them an email that they literally can just like CC the person I want them to introduce me to, to that email. In that I I say what I want from this person uh, and then also background about Kerning Cultures and, and what we've done and our traction. If we're looking for an introduction to an investor, if it's another kind of introduction, then I tailor the message uh, accordingly. And so all of our investors are very involved in opening doors for us. And, and that's what we look for when when we look for investors. And that's what I mean in terms of finding good partners. Like there's this really crass uh, terminology, especially in the Arab world, but I, I think it's in, in general, it's a universal term where they talk about investment sometimes as dumb money. In that, like somebody's literally writing you a check and then they're useless thereafter, or could even be detrimental in that they don't understand your business and then they are meddling, or maybe they now have rights because they've they've bought equity in your company for their investment, and so now they're causing problems for you, and because they don't fully understand what's happening, and and so being strategic about who you invite into your company. I mean, you're literally like it's it's a it's a partnership. I mean, this isn't. It's not a passive thing. It's 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 a partnership, and and even as founders, you as best uh, you know keep as much equity as you have in your company and and have control over decisions and all of that. But but still, like these people are now in this with you, um, and so being intentional about who you invite in is 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 really important. And so just as just as much as investors essentially interview us uh, to learn about what we're doing. We, we interview them to learn about how, what is their relationship like with their existing portfolio of investments, their existing, the existing companies that they've invested in. Um, how, how do they facilitate introductions? Are they going to be active? Are they going to sit on top of our heads? We don't want that, you know? So it's, uh, that, that's a really critical part of, of this whole process when you're fundraising 100%. When you pitch, like, do you pitch alone? Do you pitch with your team? And is it intimidating sitting with investors? I pitch alone, but it's very much supported by our team. Uh, and so Bella, our marketing director, she, she makes all of our decks and they're as awesome as they are because of it. So it's uh, so I, I go into meetings alone, but I, I'm not I'm not alone. And in terms of like now it's not intimidating. I mean, for sure in the beginning, I used to I used to be pretty nervous and and especially when we were just starting. Like now I freaking like you can wake me up at three in the morning and I can pitch <laughs> no problem. With, like I don't even look at my deck anymore when when I'm pitching, which in the beginning I was I would actually be really happy when I could have conversations with investors over conference call first as opposed to in person, because then I could be video conferencing them on one half of the screen and then have my deck <laughs> on the other half of the screen so I could like read out the slides and make sure I wasn't missing anything. Um, I don't I don't need to do that now. And that just comes with practice and having done this literally hundreds of times but uh, but in the early days for sure for sure it was intimidating and you just practice and so what I would advise from that perspective is whenever you make a list of the investors you want to approach be they individuals or, or institutional broaden out that list and find some potentials that you're actually not that excited about uh, because then you can practice pitch with them. And A, they'll give you feedback. Um, always ask for feedback as well and figure out how they're hearing your presentation. I mean, it's the same thing with, with any presentation you give, whether it's for fundraising or just a workshop or something. And then use that to help hone your pitch and get better at it. And the more times you do it, the easier it'll become. This podcast is brought to you by O'Brien Hill. 
O'Brien Hill is a leading communications agency focusing on public relations, event management, and marketing. It's made up of a fantastic group of creatives in the design and PR fields. The agency first came to life in 2010 as my brainchild. Our creative consulting services were in demand in the UK after our online publication sketchbook became an overnight success. Much like a proud mama, our agency's namesake is attributed to the place of its inception, Notting Hill. It's now 10 years later and we're one of the leading communication agencies in town and we as a team are incredibly proud to be working on this very podcast behind the scenes. Check us out on www.obianhill.com. What was the worst meeting you've ever had with an investor? The, the most challenging one, this was for our seed round, actually. I was talking to a VC and I was so freaking excited because, first of all, he found us, which was just like, I was like, oh, my God, we've arrived. You know, like <laughs> they're they're coming to us now. So he he found us. Um, he messaged me on LinkedIn and he he had this VC outside of the region. And, uh, and we had a number, but he was Arab uh, originally. And we had a number of calls back and forth. And he was super excited and he stated how much he was going to invest and, and all of this. And then with that, he literally ghosted me. He literally ghosted me. And this was the first person to commit uh, funding for that round. And so as, as any founder will know, like getting those first commitments are critical because it's a signal for the rest of the potential investors that like, oh, somebody's putting in money. Like it's a sense of validation of, of what you're doing. And so it makes the rest, like everybody will follow. It becomes easier. And so the fact that like I had this <laughs> And then it completely disappeared. Like I must have followed up with him 15 times, like literally 15 times over the course of maybe two months. And he never, to this day, I've never heard from him again. So if you were going to give any advice to an entrepreneur on seeking investment, what would that be? Practice your pitch a lot, a lot. And don't just do it in a bedroom by yourself, but like practice it on other humans. Um, One of the things that really, really helped us for our seed round was that we had gone through this media accelerator program uh, in San Francisco called Matter. And it was a five month program. And at the end of each month, we had to do um, what they called a creative review, where you would pitch your business as if you were pitching for investment to a room full of people. Every person in that audience would uh, would have a piece of paper where they would, as you're pitching, you'd five minutes to pitch, they would write down every thought that went through their mind as, as you were presenting. Whether it's, I don't understand this, or what does this mean? I don't believe this. You should think about that, whatever. Um, and that as an exercise was so useful. So at the at the end of your five minute presentation, monthly, you would get the stack of papers of feedback of how people heard your pitch. And however you can simulate that experience of, of having a room full of advisors or partners or customers or whatever it might be, I, I think that that is really, really useful because that's how you figure out your blind spots in the pitch. And, and you don't have to take everybody's feedback, but uh, but they say you should always take like the loudest voices in the room and the most repetitive voices in the room. Like that's the feedback that you should incorporate. But obviously trust your gut uh, as you hear people. And, you know, this is this is your baby. You get to make the decisions. So practicing the pitch really, really helps. Another exercise I did was writing, anticipating investor questions and writing those out and then answering them. And if I couldn't answer them, then I, I wouldn't set up a meeting, right? Like figure out how to answer them and then set up those meetings. I think the one thing that I hear repeatedly from 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 the conversations that we're having and have had with investors is um, they really love to see an entrepreneur who's driven by something. Like they they love it when you're pissed off about something, when you're solving a problem, when you're really passionate, like they want that to come through. Um, and so just be conscious of that in your presentations because sometimes, especially since you've been, you know, you 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 will do this hundreds of times, that repetitiveness could like then it just becomes, you know, like a uh, like um, like a broken record in terms of you're just saying the same stuff over and over. But just remember to keep tapping into why it is that you're doing this and why you started it so that like the heart of what you're doing can continue to come through each time as if it was the first time that you were delivering the pitch. I want to segue into Seattle and Dubai because we talked about this when we first chatted. But I just I want to know how do you find living and working from two different continents so for context so um my family is based in dubai uh and uh, and we started creating cultures in dubai and then i got married uh to a wonderful man uh who lives in seattle Uh, and so i've been shuttling back and forth for the past 
four years. And I go back and forth every six weeks was the cadence before Corona. But uh, fortunately, everything is digital. Nobody's working from the office, so it's okay. And I, I so far it's working. I, I think it's, I think it works because I get to move between two homes. Like if I, if I had to go to Dubai and stay in a hotel, I don't think it would be as sustainable. But the fact that I can just go and, you know, slide into my bedroom and, and that also just helps from a mental perspective. So you're not as disoriented, I think, going between two places so frequently. So let's just talk about your energy management, you know, doing what you do, attending all these meetings, pitching, supporting your team. How do you manage to keep your energy levels up? I try to exercise regularly and exercise really feeds me. So so that that part is um, I try to make it a priority. And, and even when I'm lazy, I, I try to say, like, I, I know I'll feel better afterwards. And so that that helps. I'm not going to pretend that I'm like a super fit athlete not at all uh if i can get to the gym or do some kind of physical activity two or three times a week i'm very very happy with myself um one thing is i've gotten older that i've tried to be more conscious of is uh, trying to have an active lifestyle as opposed to just designating times of the week where i go to a gym to be active but like trying to go for a bike ride is you know that's the thing i do with friends or to go for a swim or to play soccer or, you know i try to build that into to our lifestyle um and i think that that really helps and some other regular habits uh is i i always make time to have dinner with family uh wherever i am whether it's with my parents in dubai or here with mahmoud uh like you finish the day and the work day is over and uh and you sit down at the dinner table and you have a meal together and 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 that i hold very sacred and and that that really helps just rebalance and, and center and and you know also just keep us close because because um, I, I have I have a tendency to like let myself get sucked into to work um, and so having these sort of external uh, lines help help keep everything uh, balanced. So what is the vision for current cultures like what is your why are you doing this what's the p- big plan uh the plan is to take over the world we are building we're, we're building the region's premier podcast network with with current cultures and what i mean by that is having several shows under the network of, of current cultures in arabic and english that's the kind of of podcasts that you're you know you're going on a walk and you will walk for another half hour because you want to finish listening to the episode like creating those kinds of moments is, is what we strive for and ultimately creating the kind of media that we can see ourselves in as arabs because we have such a lack of good quality content coming out of the region it's not for want of good stories it's just i don't know our, our media has prioritized other things uh whether it's it, things that have a political agenda or it's just the same repetitive storyline of every single musalsal or film over and over and over and we're better than that we deserve more we're more intelligent we're more curious as humans and and creating content that the 140 million young arabs between the ages of 15 and 35 can can look at and say that's me you know like i see myself in that i want to be like that i want more of that just content that we can be proud of like media is so powerful in shaping our perceptions of who we are and a lot of other societies know this and that's why i mean we have such a like western media is has such a monopoly over over global (laughs) global narratives and it's because they know how to tell stories really well and so everyone wants to get obsessed with game of thrones or tiger king or whatever other production is coming out of the western world and and we can do exactly the same thing and for kerning cultures that path is is audio and, and podcasts um and from a business perspective uh we're building a a a, an incredible audience um, that, inshallah, one of the major streaming platforms of, of Spotify or Remy or Deezer will, will want to acquire one day like they did of, of Gimlet Media for $230 million last year. Hiba, thank you so much. Like, you've given me so much of your time. This was so good. I have still so many questions, but I am very conscious of time. But it was awesome. And I thank you for doing what you do. And I thank you for showing up every day with so much drive and motivation. And it's not easy being the first mover in a space like this in Mina. Um, You're literally paving the way for hundreds and hundreds of podcasts podcasters to to follow in your footsteps and you're also so gracious with your information and your time and I hope people who listen to this will be inspired to connect with you to collaborate with you or to even start their own 
podcast. So thank you. I'm extremely grateful. This was wonderful. That's it for this week. Thank you for listening to an episode of the Women Power Podcast. And thank you for downloading and streaming our podcast every week. If you love what you've heard, tag us on Instagram and follow the Women Power Podcast and Women Power Summit account for more information on our next episode. Please leave a rating review wherever you get your podcast. It really helps other women discover the show. That's it from me. See you next week.